Okay, it looks like we might have something working. We'll see how oh, things go. Good. So, Look um, at you, you technical whiz. <laughs> <laughs> who knows how long it will be working for. But um, I'll probably just do an, a, an intro again. Hopefully we've got some more people coming back to join us after the technical difficulty we had at first. But um, I'm excited to have Fleur McDonald joining me again. Um, thanks, Fleur, for joining us. So Fleur's lived and worked on farms for much of her life after growing up in the small town of Uruuru in South Australia. She became a Jillaroo before spending 20 years farming 8,000 acres east of Esperance in WA. Fleur likes to write about strong women overcoming adversity, drawing inspiration from her own experiences in rural Australia. She um, currently lives in Esperance with her two children and an energetic Kelpie. And her latest book is Into the Night, which you can hopefully see. Whoops, it's disappearing again. See my copy there. Um, and just want to mention to people who has come back to join us that thanks to Ellen and Unwin, if you type a question for Fleur and comments, you'll have a chance to win your own copy of Into the Night. So thanks, Fleur, for joining us. Um, just wondering, do you want to start off by telling us a little bit about Into the Night? Ah, yes. Well, it's the sixth in the series of the Young Dave Burroughs um, storyline, and we all seem to love Detective Dave Burroughs, so mm. he's uh, he's continuing to come along, and he is he's taking a trip to a, a town called Gorkin Up this, uh, this time, which is just a little bit out of Perth, a couple of hours out of Perth, and uh, there's a fire down there. A, um, a pump has lit up, and there's just been a great big fire go through quite a few um, farms and the the farm owner of where the fire started, Leo Perry, and his dog Leo are missing and no one can really work out where they are or if they're even dead or alive. So uh, you'll have to read the book to find mm. out the rest of it. Mm. And have to mention, because I know people sometimes ask this, like it is a series, but I think I've read this one and one other in the and I mean, I probably am, there's probably some things that you do get extra if you do read one after the other, but totally can read it by itself. And yeah, absolutely. I have still, haven't quite finished reading it. I think I've got about, I'm up to the crunchy end. I've got about 40 pages left to go. So haven't quite found out yet what happened. Um, <laughs> but totally loving it um and yeah just i found that it wanted me to keep reading it to make sure i found out what was happening oh well you've made my day to say that jackie <laughs> um that's i guess as a writer that's what we always want to achieve we want to achieve that you want to turn the page mm. and that's um that's a really um if if you know people are, are doing that and not able to put it down then we've achieved what we've, we've set out to do mm. and what sort of genre would you call your books or on uh look um it's difficult because uh you know our covers are very not so much the dave burrows but my november books which are they've still got dave in them but they are from a, a female um point of view mm. they can sort of look a bit romance type but they're they're really not you know the yeah all... well i wouldn't say into i wouldn't like that's why i was wondering because like rural romance is pretty popular in that but i wouldn't call like the dave burrow ones a rural romance at all really no, well, I wouldn't call my other ones a rural romance mm. either. You know, there's always a relationship. But mm. look, um, I think the Dave Burroughs books are, I like to think of them as crime. Like, And I mm. actually call it rural crime because they're always set in the country. Yeah. They're set, you know, out on a station or out bush somewhere. And I think, you know, really that's where Dave is at his most comfortable. So um, to try and take him into a city where and put a crime in the city wouldn't wouldn't really work for him mm. so i like to say it's rural crime it's probably a little bit softer than you know your chris hammers or um or um not 
Yeah, Jane Harper, I suppose. But I think they've still got the pacing and the mystery and the storyline there mm. to to replica a crime novel. Mm. Well, at least I hope they do. That's my that's my intention. Yeah, yeah. No, well, as a reader, certainly I, that's what I've found. Um, I've got a few people coming back, which is great. So just Yay. reminding people, if you do have a question for Fleur, please type them in comments and you'll have a chance to win your own copy of Into the Night. Um, Rachel has a question. She says, do you think your farm upbringing led to the rural storylines? Uh, look, um, I think, so I'll tell you exactly how I started writing rural books. I read Rachel Treasure's Jillaroo, and mm. I think I bet anyone that's turn, turning up here tonight to watch this will have read um, some of Rachel's books, whether it was Jillaroo or not. You know, she was, she really started this genre. She's the queen, what we would like to call the queen of this genre. So um, I think, so I was, now when I read that book, I reckon I was probably about 27 or 28. Mm. And I just thought, you know, I'm in a really good spot to write something like that. You know, I have lived and worked on farms all of my, well, ever since I left school and not, um, and yeah, at the time I had two littleies and I was pretty under the pump with, with littleies and I was working, still working full time on the farm. So look, the experiences of, that I have had working on my own place certainly comes into what I write because it's authentic and it's real. Mm. And I, I refuse to write anything at all, you know, land romantic even, you know, because at the end of the day, farming is a wonderful industry to be involved in, but it's a lot of hard work yeah. and I don't ever shy away from those sorts of things. So mm. um, it's very easy to use my experience from working on farms, but um, at the same time, I think, um, you know, you can't all, you've, you've got to push past that and put different settings in. So originally, yes, the the, um, the fact that I'd worked on farms and owned my own, own land certainly played a part in it. But mm. I was much older, um, you know, when I came into writing um, with the thought of actually getting published. Mm. Yeah, and talking about that, could you tell us a little bit more about how you got into writing and how you got that first book published? Yeah, so my son Hayden is autistic and I was writing children's books for him to try and help um, with his attention span. Mm. And I was writing about things he knew, you know, so like the, the sheep dogs, the pet lambs, the pet calves, you know, all those fun things that um, kids get to do on farms. And then I read Jillaroo and I, and I decided that I wanted to have a go at writing something myself. I, I have no... Uh, formal writing qualifications mm. um, and I come from a very long line of storytellers. My dad can, you know, start a story like this and then suddenly it ends up like this and I think I just sat down and I wrote and I, I don't like saying that because I feel like it takes away from people who have got, um, you know, have done their creative writing degree mm. or studied writing but um, realistically that's actually what happened mm. and then when I put my my first chapter and a synopsis into Alan and Unwin um, through their Friday pitch day, which is sort of like an electronic slush pile, uh, I was rejected, as all all authors are at some point along their career. And then I just thought, oh, you know, like I'd made a, I'd made a contact within that organisation. I wanted to go back and talk to them again. So I rejigged the first chapter and then sent in three chapters and a synopsis and offered to pay for um, mm -hmm. advice or, or feedback. And if anyone's watching that is wanting to submit, please don't do that because it's really the <laughs> wrong thing to do. And yeah, and then I was lucky enough, they took the book to the acquisitions meeting on those three chapters. I hadn't finished the book. I didn't have an entire manuscript to give to them. Mm. So first three chapters and I got a two book contract. So like it's the stuff that, that fairy tales are made about. Um, and I'm very, I think there's a lot of luck and a lot of timing in yeah. publishing and mm. I was at the right place at the right time and, mm. and really that that's all there is to that. Mm. And um, Rachel wonders if Detective Dave Burrows is going to make any more appearances. Uh, yes, well, I think I get lynched 
if I mm. didn't write something about <laughs> Detective Day. Trouble is, in the November books, he's actually on the, you know, he's getting close to retirement age. Mm. I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do with him then. But, mm. uh, look, yes, there's at least another four books coming. Of oh, Detective that's exciting Day. to know. So mm. you can all breathe and fight. <laughs> I was away on my, um, promoting Broad River Station in November in the Eastern States last year. And I had to promise quite a few audiences that I wouldn't kill Dave because mm. I seem to have a habit of liking to kill my favourite characters. Mm. <laughs> so I promise I won't kill him. And yes, he is still coming back for a few more books yet. Oh, that's great to hear. I'm sure lots of people will be happy with that. Um, Rachel also says it's a great name you have for his dog. How did the name come about? Coffee. Yes, mm. well, co I think I say something in there, coffee in colour and coffee in nature. Um, so, yeah, nice and relaxing or something I think I said. Look, um, in the country, you when you order a coffee, it's a bit of potluck. Sometimes you get good coffee and sometimes you get bad coffee. And just like dogs, you get good, good yeah. dogs and you get bad <laughs> dogs. So that was where I came up with coffee from. Yeah. And Kelly um, wonders if you have been surprised with how popular Detective Dave has become. Do you know, when I first started writing Dave, there is no way that I knew that that character could have changed my life yeah. the way that he has, because he really has changed my life. He's certainly changed mm. the way that I Oh, when I say the cha that he's changed the way that I write, I, I probably wouldn't have ever, you know, set story so so dave first started back in red dust so which, that which was the first book i published in um 2009 and then i wrote if i'm looking up here i'm just looking at my covers that i've got up on the wall i wrote blue skies purple rose silver clouds and crimson dawn with just minute mentions of him in there with mm. no thought process that i was going to create this whole um world around him I mm. suppose and then Emerald Springs happened which was the same year that I was getting divorced and um we were right I, I really needed to write two books a year to be able to support my kids mm. and so we started the Young Dave Burroughs series and Emerald Springs really was where Dave came into his own and people really started to love him and he was just this flawed gorgeous person that turned up and yeah like I say he's really changed my life and I feel like he's very much a part of me um he, I can write him very easily I, I think I know you know most of his reactions when to, to different sorts of situations yeah mm. and um Chanel says um what made you come up with the name of Into the Night she said she loves the name uh, well, look, I think um, I'm, just trying to I'm just trying to remember who who gave this the title. Now, it was someone within Alan and um, um, one. So I've got mm. to the point now that I've given up um, giving my books uh, titles mm. because they're never quite right. Uh, we had a funny discussion um, a few books back where um, my publisher came back to me and she said, uh, look, um, this isn't a Flair McDonald title. And I went, <laughs> I wrote the bloody book. I'm not sure why it's a Flair, a Flair McDonald title, but okay. So I, I've given up. So someone, so what we do now is um, the, um, we sort of get a list of, of potential titles and we might get, 10 or 15 and between my agent my publisher my editor and me we sort of throw it back and forth and we narrow it down and then we'll sort of come down to the last two or three and and then we really make a decision from there i would like to say that my editor i i think came up with this particular title but i'm i might be wrong she mm. might have come up with a book that's coming out in november but i think it was either my editor or my publisher that came up with that and i'm really glad you love it because when i saw it to begin with i really loved it yeah. as well and the book that's coming out in november that's voices in the dark i really love that title yeah too, that's you know? good, and, yeah yeah and mm. my editor definitely came up with that one so mm. Mm. Yeah. And Belinda said she's read a few of your books after being gifted one as a Secret Santa gift. And oh, she she loved it and she's continued to read more of your books from that. So that's good to hear. That's lovely. 
Um, Heather's got a good question. Heather says, is there any rural setting you would like to visit that you haven't been to? And also, when you visit a rural area, does it give you thoughts for a new story? Yeah, absolutely. Look, um, I'm going to be very open and frank here. Anything I do is a tax deduction because I will always <laughs> put it into a book somewhere along the line. Um, yeah, so look, when I wrote Rising Dust and Red Dirt Country, I had been tripping around the uh, the north of WA. It was when COVID would first started happening mm. and WA was shut away from all of the rest of the the rest of the nation and I couldn't go back and visit my mum and dad like I normally would so mm. I bought a camper and took my ute and headed up north and you know that um, I think I was away for nearly a month so that month I got two books out of you know I, I, I documented those settings I um, I felt you know you can write about some ways you've driven through but you've really got to get out of the car yeah. and feel the atmosphere and mm. feel the town and feel the area mm. so i certainly make sure i do all of that i'd love to go to tasmania i've been to tassie before but i'd mm. love to see if i could set a book down there um and this last tour that i did for into the night was on the air peninsula and i've just got some little ideas running around about um oyster farms and oh, okay, yeah. Um, yeah and mm. mysteries running through that i i was supposed to go down into in a shark cage and that got cancelled oh. because of the weather while i was over there but mm. i'm going back to do that in a couple of um oh, probably three or four weeks time so oh, wow. um i'll finish off my research for mm. that book um when i'm over there mm. that sounds very exciting Mm. Mm. Kim um, wonders, what do you find is the most challenging part about your writing process? Uh, do you know, it's going to be really funny because I think I differ to most authors. I find the writing of the story really hard mm. because that's where we've got to put the, you know, we've got to pull all the strings together. You've got to lay everything out properly. I love editing because the hard work's already been done, I think. Um, I and I think possibly the reason that I get, I, I find the writing a bit hard is because I don't plan. You know, one of my thought mm. processes about planning is that if I know the ending, then perhaps the reader will work it out. And mm. I don't want you guys to work it out because mm. you, if you anything like me, I'll, I'll tell a really awful little secret. But if I get halfway through the book and I go, oh, yeah, yeah, I know who did that, then I turn to the back of it and I read the last oh, chapter. Oh, really? Do you <laughs> Yeah. I, I don't read it. I yeah. don't read it. But I love it. I love it when I get to the back of that chapter and I've been tricked. Yeah. And I don't know how I've been tricked. So I have to go back and read the book then. Mm. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's how I find it. Mm. And Kelly wonders if you could describe Into the Night in five words. Leo disappears into the night. Yep, that's a great, good one. <laughs> um, Belinda wonders if any of your books have been optioned for movies, and if not, would you like who would you like to see portray Dave Burrows? Oh my gosh, I'm asked this so much, I'm and sure, you know, yeah, yeah, and do you know I don't watch very much TV, so mm. I've got no idea who's out there. So you guys will have to tell me. So yeah, maybe those watching see? can say who they would suggest for Dave yeah, Burrows. That would be good to see. It would be mm. because my theory is, I don't know if you've noticed, but if you go and look at any of the young Dave Burrows, he never has a head. No. And there's, there is mm. a real reason for that is that everybody has got their own little fantasy mm. about Dave and we don't want to upset that fantasy. We'd mm. hate to do that. Mm. So um, I guess... It's, you'll never see a head on these books. So to have someone play Dave, I'm not sure who I could ever get that would would fulfil everyone's fantasy. Mm. Someone mm -hmm. one year, one day recommended Hugh Jackman. Okay, and I yeah. just went, oh, well, look, mm. I think he's a little out of my price range. So, you know. <laughs> Do you have in your own mind, though, a clear view of what he looks like? Yep, I yeah. really do. Yeah. 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 Um, Anne wonders what or who is going to are you going to write about when Dave retires? 
Oh, look, um, I've got, I haven't probably got that far yet. And I sort of half feel that I'm not sure. It, it, Dave will retire. I, mm. I guess he really has to. But um, Dave and I sort of sometimes can live parallel lives a little bit. And I am almost at the point that, you know, my parents are getting a little bit older and my kids are off my hands, you know. Mm. Um, they just sort of come and go as they please as most kids do. Mm. And, you know, I'm in a spot where perhaps it might be time for me to go and maybe get in a caravan and go for a bit of a drive and see mm. what I find and spend some time with mum and dad and, you know, just do a few things like that. So Dave might retire and become and decide to do a lap around Australia and become a private investigator. I'm not yeah. sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure as he gets older, there's lots of other things that, yeah, he can still The one, the one thing we do know about Dave is that trouble always seems to find him. Mm. So wherever he is and whatever he's doing, mm. that's where he's going to be the, in, the, in amongst all the trouble. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and Kelly says, Dave, Detective Dave seems to be an easy character to write. Who have you found is the hardest character you've had to write? Oh, that's a tricky one to go back over all those characters. Mm. Um, some that I don't even remember. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, oh, well, look, you know, I guess to a point, Dave is, he's not as difficult as what he was to write, but, you know, male coppers writing from a female point of view can be a little bit tricky. Mm. Um, you know, you've got to make sure that you've got the right terminology, um, you know, that you're not um, putting female emotions onto a male character, um, you know, because I write a lot from inside of me. Mm. So um, I've got to be really careful that I don't, you know, project what I would feel in that situation onto a bloke when that's really um, unrealistic. So I make sure that I run whatever I... Well, so I've got a detective mate in, in Perth and um, he reads everything oh, I write. Okay. So yeah. if something sort of really jars at him... So I'm just thinking about um, Bob Holden, who's, you know, Dave's partner in this book, that, um, you know, he, he was a little bit difficult at times because he's, you know, he's that older type fella. He's in a in a world still that um, political correctness has never crossed his radar. Mm. Um, you know that that type of thing. So he can be a little mm. bit challenging. Mm. Um, but you know, I just make sure that I I get um, my detective friend to read, and if there's anything there that's really jarring, he'll let me know. Yeah. Yeah. And um, Kim wonders if there's ever been any books that you've had to change the storyline or even totally abandon. Uh, yeah, well, I didn't abandon it, but I was just about ready to toss it in the chip until mm. I caught up for dinner or for lunch one day with my detective friends. Um, so uh, now it was, um, I think it was without a doubt. And I was really, really struggling to write that book. And I probably wasn't in a really good place um, in my own life at that particular mm. stage. And so I caught up with my mate with, and we talked about everything except writing that the, for the couple of hours that we were having, having lunch. And he said to me right at the end, so how's the writing going? And I said, well, I'm stuck with mm. who, whose idea it was to become a writer because <laughs> I don't like it and I don't want to do it. <laughs> I had a little temper tantrum. And um, he, he said, well, tell me about it. And so I did. Uh, he said, look, uh, what about we make Dave do something that he's never done before? Now, I'm not going to tell you what it is in case you haven't read something to hide. Mm. Um, but I said to him, right, I, that, that actually works. Uh, but if I'm going to do this, and I need to make it authentic, then you need to be at my beck and call for the next week because my okay. deadline is in a week. He said, yeah, sure, no worries. I'm on night shift. Okay. So I, uh, I went home. I deleted 50,000 words. Oh, wow. Mm. I wrote 50,000 words in a week. Mm. He read every single one of them. And, yeah, it was something to hide. Actually, it wasn't something to hide. It was without a doubt. It was without a okay. doubt that that book happened mm. in, yeah. Mm. Yeah, so that's been my biggest. Yeah, I'm very lucky in the way that I, I'm not like uh, a lot of authors that have got 10 manuscripts in their bottom drawer. Everything so far that I've written mm. um, has been published. Mm. Mm. And what a great help um, your detective friend seems to be. 
my secret weapon. Yeah. It's not so secret. <laughs> <laughs> and Yvonne says she's loved all of your books right from the first one, which she read years ago. Um, Kim wonders if there's any other genres you'd like to write. Yeah, so uh, I don't know if anyone's read The Missing Pieces of Us, but that was certainly a, that's a more general women's fiction book about adoption. So mm. I, I wrote that. And I'm just, I'm dabbling with um, something at the moment that will will make public a, a little bit later when it's all done and dusted. So mm. yeah, look, there's other things that are coming. It's very interesting when you write this genre all the time, and even though I don't think there's a formula to it, when you try and stretch outside what you've written for so long, it can sometimes not not work, and you need to work out what hasn't worked and why. So, um, yeah, I think you've got... It's really good to stop and stretch that imagination muscle and have a mm -hmm. go at something different because, you know, this is all very easy and... Um, and I know how to do it, mm. but, but I don't want to get stuck. Mm. Like I'm always pushing myself to get better and that will make, that will come with different books and different storylines and different genres. Mm. Mm. And could you share with us what you like reading yourself and if there might be something you've read lately you'd like to recommend to us? Oh, uh, yes. Um, how to be remembered. I don't know Michael's last name. I can't remember his last name. Can someone Google how to be remembered, please? Uh, it's a it's a new Alan and Alan book that's only just come out in the last month or so. Uh, it is the most beautiful, beautiful book. It's about a little boy that's um, that on his birthday every year he is forgotten and he has to come back and oh, remake friendships of people that Michael he's Thompson known. it is. Michael Thompson, yeah. yeah. I haven't heard um, of that book, but it make, sounds... Mm. Yeah, he's got to make, um, remake all of his friends that he's known for oh. years. And it's... Oh, it just... Mm. Mm. It, it's that thought about being forgotten um, mm. and, and how he actually ends up being able to be remembered on his birthday every year. It's just such a beautiful book. Mm. Um yeah, I don't usually read books like that, but and I'm really struggling to read at the moment. I'm so busy that I tend to listen to audio books more than than read, and I listen to that on audio, mm -hmm. and oh, yeah, just exquisite. It was yeah, amazing. No, it sounds, um, sounds so, Michael, amazing. I hope I've made a lot of sales for you tonight. Yeah. <laughs> no, it sounds like a great um, book. I'll be adding it to my list. Yeah, it really is. Mm. Uh, and so, for me, um, I tend to spend a lot of time in amongst the pages of murders and mysteries and forensic science. Mm. Uh, so I come from a domestic violence um, background and I don't really believe in love or romance or anything like that. So I really try and stay away from that sort of thing and I feel very safe in amongst mm. murder and mystery. Um, and even when I do watch TV, which is very, um, very limited, I tend to go to the, you know, Mid the soft crime like the Midsummer Murders and Vera and yeah all of those those types. Mm. And, and um, Anne says she's always wondered whether you'd write another non-Dave book, and she's hoping you do because she would love to read it. Yeah, I, I will. I will be doing that. Sure. Mm -hmm. And um, Heather says, do you read or listen to true crime stories? Yeah, look, um, I do. I, I sometimes find that those podcasts are a little hard to listen to just because, oh, I don't know. I, I don't know whether they're perhaps we're so spoiled with audio books. You know, we've got beautiful um, voices reading them. And sometimes I find those podcasts a little hard to listen to. Mm. Uh, but look, I, I do. Uh, I think the last one I listened to was my te uh, The Teacher's Pet. Um, there's a lot more around, I realise. Uh, and sometimes um, I listened, I have listened to uh, um, I Catch Killers. Okay. Uh, Gary, Gary, um, someone. Mm. <laughs> That's good, isn't it? Anyway, I have listened to that and I do enjoy, I do enjoy those ones. Uh, I don't read, I don't read a lot of them. Mm. I tend to listen to them. Mm. And what have you had got coming up? Have you got any um, 
festivals or any in person library visits or anything like yeah, that? Yeah, well, can share I've just us? had like the last two books that have come out, I've just had the most fabulous time because you know, COVID's been such a mm. horrible um, thing, hasn't it? And really stopped us from getting out and talking to readers. And that's, you know, one of my favourite things to do with mm. books is, is to be able to get out and talk to everybody and, and listen to their stories and about what, the, how they, what they get out of the books. Mm. Because writing is so solitary and you can sit here in the corner of your office and tap out some words and, and do all of that and not have any knowledge about how you're impacting mm. people. And I was blown away um, by the time that I spent um, in Victoria and New South Wales and South Australia in November. And the same with the Air Peninsula just recently with Into the Night. And so, yeah, the, the plan is, it, it hasn't been organised yet, but the plan is that we will tour in um, the northern part of New South Wales, uh, Queensland, or perhaps another state um, in November for Voices in the Dark. Um, which will be, you know, fantastic. It's been a long time. Uh, mm. I think it'll probably be four or five years since I've been back to Queensland mm. um, with a tour. Uh, yeah, and it's, you know, it's just a great time to be able to get out and talk to people. And, you know, and, and you know, Voices um, in the Dark, I'm just making sure I've got the right book there. I got the idea from that while I was on tour for Broad River Station. Oh, you really? Know? Yeah. Yeah. I was mm. driving down the Hume Highway and this blue ute just shot past me. Mm. Um, and it, there was a whole splash of ideas that turned up when that happened. So, uh, you know, getting out and about is not only um, really good to talk to readers, but it's really good to, for your mind. Mm. 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 And talking about readers, is there anything you could share with us that you might have had feedback from readers that maybe really surprised you or really touched you? Oh, yes. Um, yeah, look, uh, two that happened when I was promoting Broad River Station. Um, there was a lady in Broken Hill that came up to me and she'd had a really, really tough time, but she'd had a stroke. Uh, she was having some trouble with her rehab mm. and um, she came across one of my books just out of the blue and she read it and she said it was the only thing that kept her like on the straight and narrow and not let her mind wander into a bad place was she started at the beginning and she read every single one of those 21 books, mm. which was, um, you know, that was a, that was a lovely moment. Mm. And the other one was I was in Shepherd and so anyone that follows me on Facebook knows that I do like these sneaky drops wherever I go. Um, I'll always do a sneaky drop book at somewhere across um, wherever I am. And we did a treasure hunt across Australia and I left one book of Broad River Station in Casterton, right underneath the, the Kelpie Monument there. Oh, yes. And yes. Uh, next minute I get a photo from this guy that is holding up the book and he's kissing the book. I thought it was all very cool. And we, we had some messages back and forth. And, you know, he said, "My, we've just moved to Casterton. I'm the eldest stock agent here at Casterton and I've got three little kids and my wife, um, one of our one of our kids has been quite sick. Mm. And, um, you know, the only downtime that my wife gets is when she reads your books. So I said, oh, you know, I'm really glad that you've got that book. That's the sort of person I was hoping that was going to pick it up. Anyway, that night I was speaking in Mount Gambia and I reckon it's only about three quarters of an hour between Casterton and Mount Gambia. And uh, I'm signing, all these people turned up and I'm signing the books at the end of the night. And this lady turns up with a pram and I didn't think anything of it until she held the book up in the plastic oh, no, bag with my notes still mm. on it. And she said, this is the baby mm. that we've had some problems with. Here's two hats, one for you. And then she said, one for Hayden, which is my son, which completely um, floored me that she would even know that. Mm. And uh, I just, yeah, I just got goosebumps. It was just mm. amazing. Yeah, mm. really amazing. Yeah. No, that must be great when you get that sort of um, feedback and interaction with readers. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I've still got the hats. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thanks so much for chatting with me. It's been great talking to you. And even though we had a few difficulties at the start, I'm very excited that we finished the whole interview without <laughs> Facebook dropping out. So yeah, that's, that's really great. great. Um, and thanks to everyone who joined in. We had some really great questions. 
and I hope to talk to you again when you have your next book out. Fantastic. Thanks, Jackie. Yeah, thanks for everyone that's watched tonight. It's, it's, uh, it's great to have you along because you never know. Um, but it's so good to be able to reach people when you're still sitting in your office, mm, isn't it? Mm, exactly. Well, thanks, yeah. everyone. Bye.